representing the South Dakota Hall of Fame. And today I have the honor and the privilege to have a nice chat with Dr. Jose Marie Griffiths, a recent inductee into the South Dakota Hall of Fame. So welcome, Jose. Thank you, Miles. You're a lady of many names. It's Jose Marie, it's Dr. Griffiths, it's President <laughs> Griffiths. Do you have a favorite? I, I think if people can manage the Jose of the Jose Marie, that's perfect. <laughs> okay, well, great. And your story is just incredible, but if you wouldn't mind even going back to where you were born and some of the things that occurred for you, and because it's just a very interesting story, and I, I think right. other people would love to hear that as well. Okay, happy to do that. Yes, I, from my accent, everybody can probably tell I was born in England. I was born in the outer suburbs of London um, in a place called Twickenham, which happens to be the home of Eng the English rugby football team. Um, it was a great place to grow up. We grew up a Catholic family. Um, my, uh, it was interesting. I believe that when I was born, rationing was still occurring in the UK. Um, so it wasn't a very, um, it was a privileged upbringing. Um, and education was the main theme for the upbringing. But living 20 minutes on the fast train to London, and we lived about oh, five or 10 minutes walk from the station. Um, we had the opportunity to do a lot of things uh, when we were in school. So I remember going with friends in the evening to a classical concert at the Royal Festival Hall. It was just within easy reach. I do remember we had to run to catch the last train back home. But so you can imagine this group of about 10 girls all running in school uniform trying to catch a train. Um, we also had access to the Royal Society. The Royal Society is like the National Academy of Sciences. So in high school, we were able to go, and we're privileged to be able to go to the Royal Society for the uh, Royal Society lectures. So famous scientists would come in and do a one-hour lecture, and we got to sit in on that, which was pretty amazing. The other thing is we grew up in a part of London that's not too far from Wimbledon. And uh, when we were in our junior and senior years, after we'd finished our exams, we were allowed to go out, and uh, several of us would get take a different train to Wimbledon, and we'd uh, queue up outside, and we'd get in, uh, cheap seats if you like. But the first week of Wimbledon, all the major stars are playing on the outer courts, and so you could see some really good tennis players outside, outside center court, which was really great fun. So I grew up a lot with uh, Wimbledon and tennis. And that's just an amazing childhood for you, yeah. to be able to have access to those things. Uh, but, and you mentioned the lectures that came in. Is that where your love for uh -huh. science and data and technology all came? Well, you have to understand my father was a high school math teacher. So I used to sit beside him while he graded students' homework. And um, so that was sort of part of the upbringing, the numbers and things like that were always part of it. We, you know, if you wanted a piece of cake or a piece of pie, it wasn't you know, how large a piece, it's how many degrees, right? That was the way we did it in our family. So we grew up with numbers and things of that kind. Um, no, I think I was about 10 or 11 when I read the biography of Marie Curie, and that just fascinated me. And the thought that somebody could actually discover a piece of knowledge that nobody else in the world knew until they released it was just fascinating to me. And it's, still, it's always driven my research uh, uh, ideas. I love to, you know, not I love to learn things that everybody knows, but the idea of learning something that's very, very new is, uh, is different. But I'll tell you another story. I'm thinking about mathematics. Um, when I was in grade school, well, I guess in high school, I wanted to develop a theorem you know, I didn't have an idea yet, but I wanted to develop a theorem because people's theorems are named after them. And I tried, and I always proved what I started out to prove, but it was always a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy. It was never a theorem. And we have a faculty member at Dakota State, Rich Avery, who has a number of theorems in his name, and I'm just in awe of that. That was one of my very early aims, to have a theorem named the Griffith's Theorem. There isn't one. <laughs> yet. So when you were 11, that's when you really fell yep. in love when you read the science, book? Science, uh, especially research science, yes. Tell, tell me about your degrees. Oh, um, well, I went to University College London. Um, it was the first college that was open to people of all religious denominations, and the first one that was freely open to women, um, founded in 1825, I believe, by Jeremy Bentham. I went there to study physics, so my first love is physics. I was one of three women that finished 
the degree in, fin in, in physics. I believe there might have been eight or nine women in a class of about 60 or 70 that studied physics. Um, so I was very pleased to do that. I had want my aim was to work for the UK Atomic Energy Authority. They didn't take women. So I had to change my ideas. And as part of physics, we had to learn how to program computers. We had a course called Computer Science for the Physical Sciences. And so I had to learn to program in Fortran. And I was a bit bored by that. That was easy. So I used to go to the computer center and find all the other programming languages they had and play around with those. So I did a lot of programming languages for language, um, which is how I got into AI, artificial intelligence, um, using those programming. So I then went on to do my PhD in information science. And then I had a postdoc in uh, computer science and statistics. And I had a great career. I was there almost 10 years, to, all told. Um, I was asked to teach while I was a th third year. We only have our degrees of three-year degrees in the UK. Um, a third year undergraduate, I taught graduate students all about computers and computing and how to access databases and things of that kind, which was quite a privilege. It doesn't happen very often. And this is still when you were in I was still in college, England. in England. Oh, yes, I did all my schooling, all my degrees were in England. So at what point did you come to the U.S.? Uh, well, I was, um, for work, I, I, I was invited by uh, one of the deans at UC Berkeley who had the same dissertation advisor as I did. He's from England. And he invited me to go and teach at Berkeley for a year. And so I thought, well, you know, there were a number of U.S. universities I, I was quite interested in. Berkeley was one of them. So off I went to California. I thought I was going to sunny California, you know, beach boys surfing, etc. No, it was Northern California. It was uh, foggy every morning. Um, it was quite chilly for the fall semester, but I did enjoy it. Berkeley was a rather interesting place to be. And uh, I made a lot of friends and I had a good time. I was there for a year. Uh, they offered me a position, um, but at the same time, several other universities and others were uh, knocking on the door. And I was invited to participate in a rather large-scale database meta metadata project um, by a gentleman called Donald King. And so he invited me to participate in that proposal, which I did, uh, to the Department of Energy. And they were awarded that, um, that project. And so I went then, came to the United States at that point to work. And I told my mother, because I knew she didn't want me to go this far, um, I told her it would be probably for two years, which was the length of the project, but I didn't go back. So you've been here more than two years, then I take it? A few more than two years, yes. Was that tough? Because you look at challenges uh, to, to go it's, and to move. It, it's tough to be so far away in a place that is different enough. I know people say we speak the same language, but we don't, and I had to change my vocabulary, particularly for the students, so they would understand me. Um, but it was fun to be away, and one of the thoughts I had in the United States is you can do anything in the United States, you can accomplish anything. And the reason I came in to Berkeley was I was encouraged by the funding agencies that had funded my doctoral work and my postdoc because they didn't have the kinds of funding at that time um, for any kind of science that they had in the United States. So the idea was I could come over and do much larger research initiatives in the United States. The benefit for me was then my funding agencies would have me go back to, the, to England every year to report on what was happening in North America. So I got a free ride home every year just to go See back and report. And friends. Yeah, exactly, and oh. exactly. So that was rather nice. Did you see a difference between England and the United States as far as openness to women in the job force and education? and? not in the technology area. <laughs> I mean, that is one of the big challenges that I had. You're a woman in a high-tech field. Um, I had an advantage, however. People didn't know who I was before I met them or before they met me. And I have a name that can be either. So people tended to, I mean, this inherent prejudice people have, they would assume I was male and Hispanic, and then they come in, and, and there I am. And it was interesting because it put people, you could see people were taken aback, their you know, minds are clicking away. Um, they were all very, very polite to me, but I, I had an advantage. I, could, I had an in in that respect. I could uh, 
talk freely. I could persuade them that I knew what I was talking about. But it was a hard sell because it isn't. You don't do it once. You have to do it every time you meet someone, and uh, for people to take you seriously. Yeah. Well, thank, thank goodness for your drive <laughs> that you never gave up through that process. Because because you're right. At times it had to be very very frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, and and that's the. Dr. Griffiths, I know, that's fearless and mm -hmm. just likes to drive forward and, and yep. the dreamer. Uh, yep. So what was the next stop for you? Um, the next stop after Washington was um, we went down to Tennessee. The uh, University of Tennessee and the Oak Ridge National Lab, obviously the Department of Energy, um, had done some projects for um, Oak Ridge, um, particularly on valuing information systems and technologies. And uh, they had a program funded by Martin Marietta to what they call the Distinguished Scientist Program. So I was invited to interview for that program as one of the first information computer scientists. Most of them were physicists or chemists or whatever. And they invited me down. So I had a, a joint appointment, a, uh, a, an honorary chair, and went down to the University of Tennessee to be part-time at the University of Tennessee Knoxville and part-time at the Oak Ridge National Lab, which was fun. Do you ever pinch yourself saying, is this really happening? All well, these you know, here I am back in those. physics, right? I've done all this computer science and technology. Now I'm back in physics working and actually working for a project with the University of Tennessee and the Oak Ridge National Lab at one point on the big super collider project. Um, so that was fun, uh, just sort of dipping my toe in back into my original field. Yeah. And it's amazing the contacts you made at each of your stops as yes. well. Yes. Uh, and that interaction you had with DC as well. Uh, so, yeah. so then after that stop, where was it? Then I was asked by a colleague, so I was 10 years uh, in that dual position. Well, actually, while I was there, I, got, I was promoted and asked to do other things, so I became chancellor, vice-chancellor there, um, in charge of all the technology at the university. Um, and I was asked, actually, several times by the University of Michigan, um, to consider positions there. They first approached me about being dean, but I'd just been made dean at Tennessee, and I said, no, I've just agreed to be dean here. And then they asked if uh, a colleague of mine said, can I put your name in for the uh, uh, chief information officer at the University of Michigan? Okay. Um, meanwhile, I was in uh, for the permanent CIO position at the University of Tennessee, and the chancellor, good friend, uh, Bill Snyder, said, look, um, Pursue Michigan, see what it's like, and then make up your mind. I will hold off on this appointment until you've made up your mind. And so I went through the Michigan uh, interview process that sort of dragged out over several months. And in the end, they offered me the job. And then we had the dilemma, what do we do? Because Don and I were actually very happy in Tennessee. And we sat down and we went to a coffee shop. We drank a lot of coffee that afternoon. And we did, you know, the sort of the pros and cons of staying versus going. And in the end, we felt that it was too much of an opportunity to go to the University of Michigan, which was, you know, the biggest, the best IT organization. And the president there, Jim Dudestat, was um, very much involved in and very forward thinking as a university president. So uh, we agreed to, get, agreed to go there. By the time I got there, which was four months later, unfortunately, Jim wasn't president anymore. But they put a physicist in as interim, so I was fine. And uh, then I got to meet uh, uh, Lee Bollinger, who became the president. And uh, he was not a scientist, and he didn't like technology, but he was an Anglophile. Polished up my British accent every time I talked to him, and he really just gave me free reign, which was very helpful. And that's amazing, and, and that had to be a challenge as well, moving to another university and all of a sudden yep different players different yeah, people different players involved in, and uh, but it also shows uh, your strength as well being able to adapt to different people and how to deal with different people and, yep. but the new person there the president there not knowing a lot probably gave you an incredible opportunity just to be able to do some things that you might not have been able to do exactly we we had an understanding which is you know he said well i'm really he was he was a constitutional legal scholar and just wasn't interested in technology he didn't see why and so i basically said look you know uh, i won't bother you but if i really need you i will come to you and then hopefully you'll support me and uh, i can't remember there was one time i went and um, he supported me. There was another time when I heard he was going to Silicon Valley to meet some of our alumni, and 
I wanted to be there when he went there because I knew we had some needs on campus, particularly to upgrade our network. And so I said, well, you know, I'm going to be in Silicon Valley. He said, well, you should come then. I'm having this meeting. So I went to the meeting. And at some point, they, every, Silicon Valley, everybody's asking about technology. And, and Paul Lee, sort of, what do I do now, right? He wasn't into technology. So I was there. I said, this is what it is. And we talked about uh, what, what we were doing and uh, what we needed going forward. And one of them asked, well, how much is it? And I could see Lee again going, what do I answer? And I, I said, I can't remember what it was. 20 million or something, 10 million, you know, I like large numbers, yes, uh, 10 million or 20 million. And somebody said, oh, no problem, three years, Lee, we'll do it. And that was, so after that, he truly trusted me with whatever because I was prepared ahead of time. Yeah. Well, and, and that's amazing, <laughs> but uh, just like what, and how important it is to be there. Yes. But what would have happened if you wouldn't have heard that he was having this meeting in Silicon right. Valley? Right. And because of your assertiveness, and you knew it was the right thing to do, and you wanted to meet these people, uh, what came from that? It's interesting you use the word assertiveness, which is a very American term, I have to say. Because a lot of Americans trying to work in England would put assertive on their resumes. And it's sort of um, from a British, traditional British point of view, that's not considered too good, or it wasn't in those times. And I don't think of myself as assertive. Um, in the same way that somebody in England once told me, well, you're very, well, it was in Wales, actually, you're very political. And I said, no, I'm strategic. So I don't see myself as assertive. On the other hand, I, I, I will stand my ground if I feel that, you know, I, I, I'm doing the right thing for the right reason. Yes. Yeah. So Michigan, how long were you there? I was at Michigan for six years, five or six years. And at that point, my daughter was just about to go into middle school, and I wanted to spend more time with her. The Michigan job was huge. It was the largest academic IT organization in the United States. Um, got a lot of attention, but I wanted to spend more time with my daughter. So um, we, uh, I finished the five years. We went from there to Pittsburgh, to the University of Pittsburgh. I'd had long time relationships with the university, and of course, they're right next to Carnegie Mellon. So of course, I developed my relationships with both so that I could play with the supercomputers. And how long were you at Pittsburgh then? Actually, four or five years, I believe. I was recruited from Pittsburgh to go to North Carolina. Um, I had been nominated for university presidencies for many years. And I knew from my experience at the University of Michigan that uh, University presidents have to do a lot of fundraising. It is a big, big part of their role. And I didn't think I was ready. So I'd done, as a dean, I'd done alumni fundraising. As a CIO, I had been tasked with working with the IT industry. So I had worked with um, the tech companies and, and uh, got some grants from them and some donations. Um, created some actually quite interesting agreements that were fairly new and groundbreaking. And then I felt that I had never done major gift fundraising. So um, at the University of North Carolina, the school that I went to had not, not met its goals. There was a major fundraising campaign and they needed someone to come in. And I thought, well, this is a way for me to learn that, that last little piece of um, academic fundraising. And so I went there and uh, we were able to do it fairly quickly. And I stayed there for six or seven years, um, heavily engaged in research, heavily engaged with the, um, all of the health affairs schools doing work with NIH. and. Uh, National Library of Medicine and so on. And at the end of that process, um, you know, I thought, should I retire or should I not? But I was still ready to go. I still had uh, something left in me and I thought I had at least one more position. So I had one more position left and that's when we decided to look for a presidency formally. And when you were going through that process, how did South Dakota come into the light? <laughs> Oh, well, first of all, it was the cold. <laughs> North Dakota was, was, had a lot of openings. Um, and then uh, the Chronicle of Higher Education is where presidencies typically were advertised. That uh, was before Indeed and LinkedIn and so on. And uh, so I used to take the Chronicle home every, every weekend and I sort of give it to my husband and said, you look through these, you decide which ones. But he actually wanted to move back towards the Midwest. He was uh, born in Wyoming, uh, or deep Wyoming roots, and grew up uh, most of his childhood in uh, Ames, Iowa, and um, we would go back for his high school reunions uh, in Ames, and he, I think, was hankering to get away from the East Coast, 
And so Dakota State's position came up. I said, it's Dakota, it's cold. He said, no, you should really look at this one. And so I did, and it seemed intriguing. What was interesting about DSU, it set that exact mix of degree programs that sort of matched my expertise and experience. And so I felt that I could bring something to the table. I could work with it. I could bring my contacts, which were uh, fairly numerous, having gathered them over the years. I knew people in the IT world, uh, in government and in industry, and that, that perhaps I could bring those connections to the institution. So we came. So your late husband, Don, it was him that said, yes. this is what you should Absolutely. look at. Absolutely. Okay. That's right. He said, here. So I said, okay, I'll write the letter. Okay. Yeah. When you started at Dakota State then, what was the first thing that came to you, good or bad, about Dakota State? Well, I knew we had the programs in cybersecurity. That was of interest to me. And I knew we had the uh, designations, uh, Center of Academic Excellence, three designations from the NSA and Department of Homeland Security. But we weren't doing the kinds of research that they, would, that they needed, that they were doing. And so I asked, why didn't we have a facility? I, that was, I think, on my first interview. I asked, why didn't we have a facility for doing that kind of research? Um, I also realized at that time, I, I had watched the evolution of cybersecurity for many, many years from information assurance in business schools, typically where it started and migrated beyond that. But I also knew that every university in the country was chasing cybersecurity because there were so many jobs. And so I felt, okay, we're recognized as one of the best through my conversations with NSA, which was a new relationship for me. Um, and I felt that if we were to stay in that lead pack of you know, five or six institutions, we had to conduct more research. And how could we do that? Well, as a university president, you, there are certain things you can't do. You don't interfere with faculty's individual research agendas. That's sort of sacrosanct for the faculty and the career. But you can create these opportunities for what, what we call interdisciplinary research that sits above more strategic research that's directed um, in, in a slightly different way. And so that idea of can we sort of create this umbrella of collaborative research that serves the needs of cybersecurity, particularly, say national security particularly, um, could we do that at Dakota State? And everyone was very open to it, and that's how the Madison Cyber Labs were born. Uh, that's the vision. Um, if you've ever been in them, you know we have some where there's something that's sort of fairly confidential, so those rooms have doors, but most of it is a big open space. And that's deliberate, so that projects can go in there, the labs can create projects, and we get this cross-fertilization of ideas. As people say, well, well, what are you doing? Oh, well, why don't you do this? And those ideas flow through that space. And so that became uh, the, the Madison Cyber Labs, uh, affectionately known as the Mad Labs. And it was just a great success. I think the key, Miles, was we started to organizing the research efforts before we ever had the space. And then we, uh, we were able to get the space. Thank, thank you, and Danny Sanford and Lisa. Um, we were able to get the facility built that, that simply then we moved those projects in. And the day we opened in 2019, fall of 2019, we had a number of vibrant labs. We had a number that was still start up, but I think we had nine or ten vibrant labs. Um, and as I looked at the sponsors of the research for, that was being done there, we had local sponsors, we had state sponsors, and we had national. So to me, it was highly successful, and I, I mean, and the faculty basically took, had taken the idea and run with it. I didn't do anything more except to say, let's do this, and this is how we might move forward, and let's find some, some sponsorship for it. And right now, when you joined Dakota State, how many students were there when you joined? Oh, gosh, I don't know. I honestly don't know. Fewer than that. <laughs> yeah, I would guess in, in that 1,500 range to uh, 1,800 probably at uh, that time. I, I could be. I, I, I'm, and today I'm you have? Over 3,500. Over 3,500. Mm -hmm. That's just incredible. Yeah. And job placement. Oh, yes. Job placement's always been very high at Dakota State. Um, you know, we had 97 for all. We had 98, 98, 98 point something, 99. This year we were 99.7. We always rounded it because, you know, people don't need to know the point. Well, it's 98%, 90. 
but I can't say 100% because you know, nobody would believe me if I said 100%. It was 99.7, the first time we've used the decimal point. But, and that's just amazing. But, but there's so many jobs. Um, but the other thing is we don't wait till the students' senior year to start getting them to think about jobs. We do it from the moment they come. We give them business cards. We get them thinking about a resume. We give them opportunities to interact with um, the outside world. We give them a lot of... Uh, uh, different kinds of experiences outside of the classroom that help build their resumes. Um, they can do undergraduate research, they can go on international trips, they can do internships, they can do apprenticeships. Um, a, we call all of these high impact practices in education because they just round out the student. Uh, competitions is another way. Our students are very competitive. They like to compete on just about everything. And um, that gives them a different skill set, right? They learn what they're good at. They learn how to contribute to a team and how they can leverage the benefits of somebody who's got different skill sets. Um, they learn how to deal with loss, which is always a good thing, um, since we get, tend to get more losses than more hits um, in the world. They learn to represent the institution, what they call agency, because they go out and they compete with others, and so they're representing us. So we, we give them you know, jackets so that they, they're obviously clearly a team, and they, they, they're more than just individuals clumped together. And uh, our students are great. They, uh, they love it. Um, they do really well. They work hard. It's a characteristic of the Midwest, as you know. Um, and so we've got really, really talented young people who just need to be given an opportunity to be shown what those opportunities are and be given the skill set and the knowledge to be able to go out and hit the ground running. Yes. Well, you, you also have incredible relationships that help open those doors for those students. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about some of the national agencies that yeah. you've worked with in the past and you're working with today? Uh, national Science Foundation, uh, largest uh, funder of science outside of Department of Energy. Um, I've been involved with NSF since, oh gosh, the early 80s, I think, um, both as a grantee um, and then on various committees. And then I was on the National Science Board eventually. So that was, I met a lot of people. And one of the things I learned early on is it's good to maintain relationships with those people. You don't meet them once or you don't sit on a committee for three years or six years or however long and then just disappear. You, you stay in touch. And those can be very helpful. Um, and so as one of, the, one of the pieces of advice I have for young people is it's easier to stay in touch now, but stay in touch with those people. because And if somebody's helped you, just let them know how you're doing as you go forward so that they can continue to follow your career. Um, and so that's it. So National Science Foundation is one. I went on the President's IT Advisory Committee. Uh, Mark Benioff, the CEO of Salesforce, was co-chair with uh, uh, one of the faculty at the University of Washington. But there were lots of corporate people on that board as well. And so I got to know them. Um, I, had al I already knew the big, the big ones, um, you know, with the big uh, Microsoft and Google and Apple. Um, uh, while at, particularly while I was at Michigan, I went on their advisory committees and then because we were the largest purchaser in the academic world and we influenced a lot of others, I was on their higher level platinum committee as maybe one of two women, but usually the only academic. Um, so that was interesting as well, going to their meetings and interacting with them and um, not just with uh, the senior people, but actually with, with Bill Gates himself at the table, with Steve Jobs and, and uh, Scott McNeely and so on. Yes. Well, men, you notice at the time. <laughs> but you're helping to change that. I'm trying. I'm trying as hard as I can. Yes. But your contacts give those students that graduate just an incredible opportunity, yes. and for a direct line into those organizations. But you've taken it a step further, and you're saying, well, instead of them going to the East Coast, let's keep them in South Dakota. Yeah. Yes. And you uh, started the Mad Labs, and can you tell us a little bit about the next project? Yes, in Sioux yes, Falls. Yes, the um, so so first of all, you, you have to understand that having worked at so many public universities and then one private, I have a very strong philosophy of the, about the relationship between the public university and its host community and its host state that's funding it, and um, and I believe that part of our role is economic development, and research can generate economic development as can graduating students. So we were losing uh, our most technical students to the coast or the national labs because they had to work in secure facilities and we didn't have any secure facilities in the area. And so I felt if we could find a way uh, with, with, with the Mad Labs, we built a secure facility. 
And that was one way of sort of keeping them. But there was so much interest, and not just from the NSA and the um, Department of Homeland Security and the various subgroups there and the intelligence agencies, um, but there was a lot of interest by the big defense contractors too. You have this facility. So as we built that, we realized there might be more demand. And so the idea was if we could build a, because we're somewhat, I mean, it's a big facility for what it is, but we could build bigger. If we could build a bigger facility, if we could create a research park, if you like, um, then we could, we could keep our students here doing the same work they would be doing in those uh, agencies or in those uh, defense contracting organizations, but doing it in South Dakota. So because there was no need for them to be in other places except they had to have the special facility. So the facility became the driving force. And uh, we, we have a, a license to do that kind of work. It's called a facility clearance. It has nothing to do with the facility, but we have a clearance. DSU holds one. And you can, do, you can operate that anywhere in a 50-mile radius. So we looked at where we might locate a facility. And uh, well, Brookings was obviously an opportunity, and Sioux Falls was the other main opportunity. But we felt if we were doing a lot of work for uh, federal government and defense contractors that are all around the, the DC area, then probably they would want to have some proximity to the airport. Mm -hmm. And so we started looking at Sioux Falls and talking with Forward Sioux Falls, Sioux Falls Chamber, Sioux Falls Development Foundation, the governor, etc., and others. Um, and we came together to create this very large public-private partnership. Denny Sanford, yourself, you were involved in that, the governor, the city of Sioux Falls, um, to actually build a facility um, uh, in Sioux Falls that will allow us to graduate our students directly into positions there. And the aim is uh, for the first building, we're hoping, you know, 400 plus uh, researchers, and we're hoping eventually we might have three buildings out there, and, and who knows beyond that. Yeah, I mean, the thing that I just find amazing there is we have a lot of presidents, not only in South Dakota, of universities, but around the country. And you came in here and really provided the tools for the students to go anywhere they wanted to go. Mm -hmm. And the tough thing is a lot of them were going to the coast for these incredible jobs, but they were leaving the state. Yeah. And you found a way to uh, build a facility, have the partnerships uh, with the government or contractors of the government to be able to keep those students here in South Dakota. Mm -hmm. And it would have been very easy for you to continue graduating and let them go off and right. you've done your job. But you've taken that extra step to say, how do we keep these incredibly bright students in South Dakota mm -hmm. after they graduate, which I just think is uh, phenomenal. When you look at the impact that you're having on the state of South, South Dakota in really a short period of time, uh, and that's exactly what we want to do is keep our best and brightest in South Dakota. Right. Yeah. And because of you, that's a huge step forward that we've now made. And uh, so I have to oh, say thank, thank you. you. Can I take a link back, though? Yes. There, there's a reason. When I spent my 10 years in Washington, D.C., that's what I was doing, writing proposals, hiring people to work on the research. I worked with a number of different agencies. It was never NSA, but you know some of the other three-letter agencies, plus some others. And um, I spent 10 years. That's what I did. I, we ran a research company. I knew how to do it. If I hadn't had that experience at King Research, I doubt that I would have brought that context to DSU. So for me, it's all coming full circle. All of that experience, not just in higher education, but the 10 years I spent in Washington, D.C., performing research for various federal agencies, and then those contacts that I made. And uh, that then comes back. And uh, it's very satisfying to sort of have gone full circle and to say, oh yeah, something I did way back then, decades ago, is now coming to fruition here, because I know how the federal government works. I know how their contracting works, and I've been able to be successful at it. Well, all I know is South Dakota's very lucky <laughs> to have Yosey Marie Rufus <laughs> at Dakota State. Uh, but I think you're also setting the bar higher for the other presidents within the state, uh, for the universities, to say not only do we want to send the kids out, graduate them with great degrees and give them tools and all those things, but find a way to be able to keep okay. them here in South Dakota. And we just haven't seen that in the past. So uh, yeah. huge thank you uh, oh, thank for you. doing that. Uh, Yosey Marie, anything else that you'd like to touch on that we have not? Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful to the Hall of Fame. This is amazing, um, actually phenomenal. And um, 
You know, I, I have profound, profound gratitude to the people of South Dakota who embraced me. Um, one of the challenges in moving from place to place, especially for somebody who's sort of born outside of the country even, is that you have to make connections. You can't do, you can't be a university president without making connections. And there's a, there's a tremendous amount of energy that has to go into building those connections. And every time you move to a new place, you have to start from scratch. And so you do have to become good at it. You have to go out and meet people. Um, so, you know, you know, my natural inclination is as an introvert, uh, my daughter says, Mom, you an introvert? But yeah, natural introvert. But you have to sort of have to do it. I enjoy doing it. People have always been very open and welcoming. But I think, you know, at DSU, people were not quite sure about me. Um, but they were willing to listen, give me, some, give me some time. I listened to them. And we came forward with a vision that we could put together. And then they jumped in to help implement it. The people of Madison, very, very open. Um, again, I listened. They listened. We put forward ideas. I got involved in community organizations. And so we have strong relationships. Sioux Falls, the same thing. Uh, we didn't abandon Madison when we started going and talking with Sioux Falls. Madison is the engine that will drive everything we do in Sioux Falls. But again, the Sioux Falls community, very open, very interested in what we were doing and uh, understanding of the sort of underlying concept of what we were trying to do. So um, I've been very grateful to the people of South Dakota. It's sort of a place in my heart now. Well, that's, good. that's good to hear. I, again, I just think it's amazing uh, that we have you in South Dakota and everything that you've accomplished in really a very short period of time. Uh, what is, do you ever take a second to think about where you were uh, going back to London mm -hmm. and where you're at today and all the stops that you've made between those and just say, how in the world did this happen to me? I couldn't have imagined it. I mean, I thought I would be a scientist in a lab and that's what I would be doing. And that's, that's what I envisioned. I mean, I, I never imagined the pace at which technology would change. I mean, I, I, I was driving somewhere recently, you know, we have nice long drives in South Dakota, and I can think about things. And I was thinking about all the technologies that I've been involved in from the beginning. And I wasn't in at the very early days of, of computing, but almost. And so I've seen that whole arc of development and it is accelerating and so in a way I feel that I'm a living history of computation in the, United, in, in the world and that's fascinating really that I think about young people I mean we got to the point where young people always knew the internet existed or the World Wide Web whichever version you want to talk about um, now we've got people who've always lived with uh, AI assisted devices artificial intelligence assisted devices they may not realize that but they have and so they don't understand where, where all this came from. And yet, I've seen patterns, that patterns repeat over history. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's, it's just very interesting. There were times where we didn't have computer memory for anything, and it was very hard to do anything because, because we had to manage memory. And then memory became as inexpensive as it could be. And so now we changed our procedures because we didn't have to do that. We have a new computing mechanism methodology coming soon, a new technology coming soon, quantum computing, that's going to revolutionize computing for those projects that, and, and problems that we can't solve right now with uh, traditional computers. That's going to bring me back to physics, too, in a very interesting way. So I, I just think, um, you know, life revolves in circles and recognizing them and uh, celebrating them and always having a positive attitude. And I, I think everybody wants to do well. Nobody wants to be unhappy. So how do we make people happier by finding the right fit for them? Mm -hmm. And uh, this notion of fit is, is very important. So students have to find what they're passionate about. Um, we tell them to find careers that they will love. I love my career. I work hard because I enjoy it, not because I feel I have to. But I just enjoy it, and I love I love learning, and every day I learn something new, um, and that's what drives me further. Yeah. And, and that's been just fun to watch is your passion and love to continue to learn, and and I also would say dream, <laughs> and uh, because there's always something else out there, 
and you've never fallen into a comfort zone saying, okay, I've made it to where I want to go, mm -hmm. and this is it. There's always something more out there, and it's been so good for us to watch and so good for Dakota State, for Madison, and for South Dakota as well. So all I can say is congratulations Thank and welcome you. to the South Dakota Hall of Fame. Thank you, Miles. Thanks a lot.